everyone, I am Anna Hyatt Huntington, and I'm so glad to see so many of you here from Reading that you are interested in the history of Reading and the wonderful Mark Twain Library. You know, I lived in Reading. It was called Stanrig. It was off Black Rock Turnpike for almost 40 years. I lived longer in Reading than any place else. You know, now you probably know it as Collis Huntington State Park. Well, Collis was my father-in-law. Wonderful, wonderful man. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, just who are you? Many people know me. Many people don't. I am known as the woman sculptor, the most famous woman sculptor in the early days that nobody ever heard of. Now, the reason you've never heard of me is because I was born in 1876. And also, even today, only 3% of the sculptures are of women and less than 2% are done by women. Like everything else, it was a man's world and they did not recognize women. But let me start at the very beginning of my story. I was born in Boston and I was brought up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, my father was a famous professor at Harvard and MIT. He was a paleontologist, he was a naturalist, a conservationist, but most of all a zoologist. And he was the one who did the research on the evolution of the squid and the octopus. And he also started the very famous Woods Hall Marine Institute on Cape Cod. But why do I remember my father? Oh, he spent hours with me. He would bring me home his books on zoology. We would go over these books and study every animal, their anatomy, their movement, their personality, their characteristics. Then he would take me to the circus. Oh, we went to the circus not to see any circus acts. We went to the circus so that we could watch the animals. They had animal pets. We wanted to see how the animals moved and acted. Then we would spend so much time at the zoo, but we didn't go to the zoo like other people did. No, 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 not like that. We didn't go from cage to cage to cage to cage. We had elephant day, and we would spend hours examining, watching the elephants. We'd go back another day. We had tiger day. And that way I learned about all these animals in great detail. Now we did also in the summer go to Cape Cod. I love the Cape Cod, the coastal birds, the animals of the sea. And my nickname was the clam. Now I wasn't called the clam because I was just so quiet and reserved. I could take a clam and examine the inside and outside for hours. Now, who does that kind of thing? So I became the clam. But most of all, oh, horses did. I love horses. My uncle had a farm, horse farm in Maryland. That was my favorite place to go. And I remember I was very young and I came in and I was covered with mud all the way down the front of me. And my aunt said to me, Anna, what in the world have you been doing? How did you get so dirty? And my cousin said, oh, Mom, you know, Anna won't even play with me. All she does is lay on her stomach, nose to nose to a horse. And my aunt said, why would you do that? And I said, I want to see the jawline. I want to see how it moves so that I can draw it and I can understand it. I was known as a weird, strange child. 
But to be creative, sometimes that's how you have to be. Well, I was going to be not a sculptor, no, 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 I was going to be a concert violinist. Now, I haven't told you about my mother yet. She was amazing as well. While my father was totally into animals, my mother was totally into plants. She was one of the first women landscape architect designers. She knew her flora and fauna like no one else. In fact, when the wars came, what did I do? Even right here in Reading, I put up a victory garden, the most amazing victory garden. I learned how to preserve it, can and serve the troops, set up Red Cross units and so on. Now, my mother was also a pianist and a violinist. And as a very young girl, I started violin lessons. Oh, I practiced. I love to practice. I love to play with my mother. I love to go to concerts. I was going to be a concert violinist. But then something happened. My sister Harriet, who was older, was going to be a sculptor, and she was always sculpting. And one day she was making Scottish deer hounds. Those were the pets that we had in our family. They were beautiful. And Harriet said to me, you know, Anna, um, I can't get this right, you know. The hind legs are coming right. Do you think you could help me with this sculpture? I said, I don't know, I don't do that, but I draw animals and I love our dogs. I took on her challenge. I worked for a couple of hours. I said, Harriet, what do you think? <gasps> she said, that's perfect. How did you do that? And I said, I observe, I draw, I reflect. I observe some more, I draw, I reflect. You know, that was really fun, Harriet. And Harriet said, why don't we begin to work together? We began as a unit to sculpture. We even won a couple of awards. And in my early 20s, there was another woman, Abby Ebersole, and she wanted to work as a team as well. We actually won awards too. Boy and goat man and bull. They were wonderful sculptures, but you know, when you're a true artist, it's hard to work with another person because you have your own vision and your own ideas of how it should be. Well, my sister went off to college and I started to begin sculpturing on my own. And I found out, oh my God, I don't want to be a concert violinist. I, like Harriet, want to be a sculptor. But how can I tell my parents? Well, I went to my parents and I said, I'm really sorry and I apologize. But you know, I like sculpturing more than I do the violin. I still love the violin. I want to take lessons, but I want to become a sculptor. Oh my God, my parents ran, they hugged me. They said, Anna, we don't care what you want to be. We just want you to have passion and dedication and love what you want to do. We're here to support you, whatever you do. That was such a relief to me. I couldn't believe it. So I began to sculpt. I began to sell little sculptures, $25, $50, $100 on Antique Roadshow. Some of my first little sculptures are going for $12, $15,000. I was so surprised. Well, my father decided I should go to the Art Students League. And I studied with Borglund, he was the man who was the sculptor of the presidents out west. I studied with George Bernard. I studied with Howard O'Neill.
I studied with H. H. Kitson. Now, I'll admit, I did have a problem with Kitson. He was a very good sculptor, but there were discrepancies in his horses. They weren't really anatomically accurate, and I thought he might want to know this. Oh, he did not want to know this. So after I told him, he blew up at me, threw me out of the class, called my father and said, your daughter is nasty and disrespectful and needs to be punished. My father called me in and he said, look, he said, I am not going to punish you. But Anna, I hope you learn from this. You don't tell any well-known sculptor what's wrong with their piece of work. You know, if they ask, try and be tactful, but don't ever do again what you did. Well, I never, ever did that again. Well, after the Art Student League, I started to travel. Oh, I love Spain and Italy and England and France. I went to the 200 most famous museums in the world. Later on, my sculptor was in all 200 of these museums. Well, in my very early 20s, I was 1900, I had my first woman show. 40 sculptures. Oh, the ratings, the acclaim that I got. I couldn't believe it. I was so young. I was basically just starting out. And then, in 1902, my first major sculpture came out and was unveiled, and it was called Winter Noon. I told you how I loved horses. Two horses. They showed friendship. All of my sculptures told stories. They didn't stand alone. These two horses were there for each other. They were the same as brothers and sisters in a normal family. They were covered with a blanket. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art right now. And then, in 1904, I was the first woman sculptor, the World's Fair. Who would have thought in my 20s that I would have had sculptures in the World's Fair? And then in 1906, I started working with my jaguars, my panthers, my tigers. They were prancing, they were crouching, they were stretching. Two of them are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art outside as well. And then in 1908, one of the largest sculptures you ever want to see. It was a lion, and it was commissioned to go to Ohio. People said, oh, a woman could possibly have made that lion. Just women were not known as sculptors of any type. Well, after that, 1910, France. I get a call. They want me to do Joan of Arc. I love Joan of Arc better than anything else. I had done sketches and models of Joan in prayer, Joan in triumph, Joan in defeat, Joan in reflection. They wanted one of my Joans. I go to France. I rent outside of Paris, a barn, and I rent a horse, I work from real horses, I don't work from any pictures. I buy ten and a half tons of clay. I don't come out of that barn for four months. I work ten hours a day. If you're going to be an artist, you put in more time than a nine to five job. You don't just wait for the inspiration to come, you work every day. Well, at the end of the four months, we have the unveiling. Great acclaim. Big article. 
and the Paris newspaper. A woman did not do this. A woman could not possibly have made this statue. Where was she? Nobody saw her. There is no proof this American woman is taking credit for something she did not do. I was horrified at this, and I decided after that, open doors, pictures, come and watch me as I sculpt. In 1915, America said, we want you to do another Joe, 93rd Street. There's no other women, live women statues in the city, much less one done by a woman. I was so honored. Oh, for the unveiling, there was a marching band. Truman and his wife were there to speak. Daughters of the American Revolution spoke. Oh, I was so, so proud. This event was so big to me because, you know, it took 120 years after my Joan of Arc in New York City for another woman's sculpture to be done. Yes, and it was somebody that really looked up to me. Meredith Bergman in Ridgefield during the pandemic unveiled the women's suffragettes in Central Park. Well, something else happened in 1915. There was a survey. Now, in 1915, $50,000 a year salary was big. They found that there were only 10 women, artists, in the whole United States that made $50,000 or more in 1915. I was one of them. I didn't do what I did for money. But this was good because I could see that I was being successful and making my mark. I want to talk about other women sculptures other than Joan. I also came to Reading, and for the first time, I learned about Sybil Luddington. Sybil Luddington was this young girl, 16 years old, during the Revolutionary War. She was our Paul Revere. She warned that the British were coming in the Danbury area. Now, if you remember about Paul Revere, and everybody knows Paul Revere, he wrote with another military man. He was in his 40s on a military horse. He went down streets that he knew they were regular cobblestone streets. The weather was good, and he traveled for 12 miles. Oh, Sybil Luddington, 16, traveled alone. The worst storm you could imagine, through the forest for over 40 miles, never having taken that trip before. I was so inspired. I needed to make a statue of Sybil Luddington. If you go to the Danbury Library, there she is at the entrance. If you go to Carmel by the lake where she actually rode, you will see her statue. It's in Brook Green in South Carolina, my sculpture garden. And it's also at the Women's Museum in New York City. And you will see her riding in a petticoat riding side saddle with a special woman's harness. And in her hand is a stick. And people say, why is there a stick in her hand? Because her father gave it to her. That was the weapon she would use if anyone captured her or if there was an animal. This is what she would use to knock on the doors of the houses because she didn't have time to get down. This was the stick that she used to prod her horse. I did so much research when I made any of these statues. I also did Diana of the Hunt. 
Diana of the chase. She was mythological, but she embodied all the good characteristics of women. And there are two Dianas in New York City. And then I did Lady Godiva. Lady Godiva. Yes, back in medieval times, she helped to lower taxes. But in 1913, Lady Godiva led the suffragette march in Washington, D.C. to tell Woodrow Wilson and the rest of the country that women needed the right to vote. Well, after my travels, I found that I love Spain in particular. And for men, one of my favorite statues is El Cid. El Cid, again, was an inspirational military man, politician, humanitarian. He knew how to lead. Another one of my male statues that I really was inspired, Don Quixote. Oh, he was crazy, he was insane, people said all kind of weird things about him. But he followed his dream. He never gave up on what inspired him. He stood for what was important to him, no matter what anybody else said. And then probably the most moving of all of the statues that I made was Jose Martí. He was the Cuban hero. He saved the Cubans from the Spanish before Castro. Again, he embodied everything that a true leader should have. He sacrificed so much. And the people of Cuba came to me with their pennies and dollars and coins that they had collected and said, we want this statue. We want this statue of our leader, and we want it in Central Park, and that's where it stands today. I'm going to take a little deviation now, and instead of talking about my sculptures, I want you to know about my husband, Archer Huntington. Well, I never thought I was going to get married. I didn't get married till I was 47. Um, I was almost six foot tall. I wasn't particularly attractive. I spent so much time traveling and drawing and researching. And as I told you, it was not unusual for me to work 10 hours a day, six, seven days a week. So I never really dated, never cared about dating. And I became very involved with the Hispanic Society in New York. And they had a Beaux Arts Ball. So uh, it was a fundraiser, so I decided I'd go. And you're supposed to wear some sort of a costume. Well, I got there. Oh my goodness, the women, the gowns, the hair, the jewelry, the makeup. And here I walk in, almost six foot tall, no makeup, hair back, tied back and everything, and I'm in a full suit of armor like Joan of Arc. And everyone's like, oh my God, who is this woman? Well, lo and behold, Archer, who had kind of met me casually, had never really talked to me, was very taken that I was going to come in this attire. He sought me out, we started talking. For 32 years, we never stopped. My nephew said we were Tweedledum and Tweedledee. We just supported each other. We had so much in common. I knew all his poetry. I knew his scholarly work in Spain. He knew about my drawings, my sketches, my sculpture, my father. And would you believe this? We had the same birthday. So we decided when we got married, we would get married on our birthday, because then we'd have a three in one day, two birthdays, and an anniversary. Well, who is Archer Huntington? Well, his grandfather started the Southern Pacific Railroad. His stepfather was Collis Huntington. Oh my goodness, he continued the railroad. 
He's worked with the Transcontinental Railroad. He started huge sip shipping industries. Uh, he was one of the most wealthy men in the entire country. Now, Collis had been married first, and then he married Archer's mother. And Archer, as I said, was his stepson, but when Archer's mother died, all of this tremendous fortune went to Archer. Did Archer and I want money to be rich, to buy lavish things? No, not at all. We were very frugal. In the mid-1900s, we donated and endowed over $50 million. In the end, we had something like 20 art museums that we started and endowed. There were six or seven natural life conservancies that we started or endowed, and that's not even with Huntington State Park and Brook Green. Well, what is my husband known for? My husband was a poet, he was a linguist, he was a translator, he was a scholar, he was a professor, he was an editor, um, he was an essayist. He was as accomplished, if not more, than I was, and we totally supported one another. Now, he had been married previously for 25 years. He married his cousin. After 25 years, she left him for a British playwright. He never thought he would marry again. We never had any children. Our children, of course, was the artwork. Well, when I married Archer, he had so many properties. I had to make a chart to find out where they were. Uh, we had a wonderful apartment in New York City. He had one in San Francisco. He had them in London and Paris and Italy. He had apartments all over. He had a place in the Adirondacks. He had a place on the Hudson and in Haverstraw, New York. And my head was just spinning with all of the places he owned. And, you know, I said, Archer, I don't think we can handle all these. Could I have something of my own? You know, I love this place in Reading. It's just so, it's like being in the Adirondacks, but you're near New York City. I would love to live there. And I did have TB, and I wasn't that well, and I wanted a place that was warm. So Archer and I decided to endow and to give these various places that he owned and make them a part of the art world. The Adirondacks I stayed in for a while is called Camp Pine Knot. It's acres and acres of wilderness in an authentic Adirondack camp. It is so beautiful. And what did we do with it? We gave it to Syracuse and we gave it to Cortland University for their programs. The students still go there for training and love it. And what they love is that when I was there, I did build a houseboat. And I put it in the middle of the racket lake. And why did I do this? Because in the Adirondacks, I did research, the black flies in May and June are so horrible and they don't go over water. So I could still sculpt and draw and observe in my houseboat on the lake. So if you want to see that, you can go to Camp Pine Knot. And from there, you know, in Reading here, we have wolves and bears at Huntington Park. Where do you think the idea came from? It came from Camp Pine Knot. Well, we also gave away the place on the Hudson. And in Haverstraw, we had a little small zoo. And I was at that time sculpting monkeys, wild boar, wolves, and bear. So we had this mini museum. And the mini museum 
is still there. And going back to Syracuse University is because of our relationship with Syracuse, I began to lecture there. And they gave me an honorary degree. And if you want to do more research on me, if you want to see my journals and diaries and my illustrations, you go. And they have right there the Anna Hyatt Huntington Library section. And I'm very, very proud of that. So anyway, we got rid of a lot of these places, all for good. And I said, I'm coming to Reading. Well, remember, it's called Stanagra. And this is meaning rocky ledge, rocky area. I loved it. It was 800 acres, five ponds, a lighthouse on one of the ponds. There is supposed to be at the bottom of one of the lakes a little paddle wheeler boat that was used at one time. There's a farmhouse, so I had a working farm there. There were cows and there were pigs and there were chickens and of course there were stables for horses as well. And then those beautiful deer hounds I told you about, they were becoming extinct. So our family decided we were going to begin to breed them. So in Huntington State Park there are kennels for a hundred of those beautiful Scottish deer hounds. Oh, it was such a glorious place with trails everywhere and out front two of my favorite statues, the howling wolves. This theme is communication. You look at their throat, you look at their body and you can tell are they calling for a mate, for protection, for location, for frustration, you can tell by their body movements, the communication. And then next to it, mama bear, baby bear. You always hear, do not get between a bear and the cubs. Just look at the eyes of that bear. That bear is willing to do anything to protect those two cubs that are at her side, and her hands are cupped over them so she can go any way she can. What is the theme of that? It's protection, a mother's love and protection. So that was the place I loved the most. My second favorite place was Brook Green. Oh, Brook Green is near Myrtle Beach. And if you're ever in this area, even if you're not an art person, go there. It was the very, very first sculpture garden. There were sculpture halls, sculpture museums, and there were gardens. I took what my mother loved, plants. I took what my father loved, animals. And I put the two of them together. There's 1,000, 12,000 acres there. There's also an island for migratory birds. There are two marine museums that you can visit. There are 40 acres of formal gardens. And there is this huge butterfly. And the huge butterfly encompasses all the trails where you can go and walk and see 900 to 1,200 pieces of sculpture. The best sculpture you will find anywhere. There's a few pieces of mine. There's some of Harriet and mine. Some of my friend Abby and mine. There are examples of the greatest sculpture throughout the ages. There are new sculptures. The sculptures keep changing as there are themes. So you can visit it one year and come back another year. Now, what was Brook Green before? It was the Huntington Garden and Sculpture Area. It was three rice plantations, antebellum plantations, beautiful homes 
with slave quarters. We combined the three plantations, ripped down the antebellum homes, got rid of the slave quarters. And what did we do? We put up beautiful statues to commemorate these slaves. And there's a woman from Reading that we don't want to forget. Babbitt Block, she did a tribute to the slaves in that area the same way that I did. And I am just so proud of this woman. Her husband is a sculptor as well. So that's Brook Green. And standing out in front of Brook Green is a statue that is also in Reading and is called Fighting Stallions. And this is all about competition. It's not going to be a win-win situation. There is going to be a loser. And you look at the horse's body. What are they competing for? Are they competing for pride? Are they competing in a relationship? Are they competing for territory? You can read into the body of these animals what the competition is all about. I'd like to just sort of review right here in our area the statues that you can see. You probably go by them all the time and never realize that Anna Hyatt Huntington, myself, was responsible for them. I talked about Danbury, Sybil Luddington. Please wave to her as you go by as she's raising her stick. Okay, now right here in Reading, we talked about fighting stallions at Brook Green, and that is also right here in Reading at the school. Now, at the other school, they have horses, and this is a powerful, powerful statue, and it's a workhorse. This is a horse near the end of its life. You can see that it's had a hard life, but the farmer has also had a hard life. And the two of them are codependent. They helped each other. They cared for each other. They worked the land. It is such a powerful story. Now, I also told you about the wolves. That's at my park. And I told you about the bear, and that's at my park. Right here at the Mark Twain Library is one of my all-time favorite. It's called the Torch Barrier. It's right at the entrance of the library. I believe in this. I believe that history repeats itself, that we have to listen to our elders, that we have to learn from them. This is an older man who has fallen. He's holding on to a rock. But with his other hand, he is reaching up with a torch to give his wisdom, his knowledge, his training to this young man who is going to ride off into the future with what he has been told from this man. Is that powerful? Yes. Now, this statue is all over. You will find it many places. It was at the Discovery Museum, also in Bridgeport. However, museums have trouble economically. It had to be auctioned off, so I don't know where it really went. Bethel has two of my last statues. I made them when I was in my 90s. I never stopped working. There is young Abe Lincoln. He was an itinerant lawmaker. You will see him on his horse working with his law books as he rides from courthouse to courthouse. This man was always planning, thinking, solving, learning. It's such a powerful statue. He was such an inspiration for me. And you will also see General Israel Putnam in Bethel, and of course Putnam Park. This was a very difficult statue to make because 
the horse is going down steps. Now, why is the horse going down steps? Putnam was captured by the British. He had to get away because he had learned the plans for the attack on New York City. Somehow he was able to get, jump out of the window, get onto a horse, get down these steps and escape from the British so he could get to Greenwich and reveal the plans that the British had for the attack on New York City. So those are the sculpt. That's what we see in our area, in New York City. There are so many of my statues, and uh, again, I'm going to have to just go through some of these quickly. I talked to you about El Cid, one of my favorite, the Historic Society, the Spanish Hispanic one, is where you can find that. Joan of Arc, 93rd Street, Joseph Marti, Central Park. Now, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, inside those two horses, winter noon. And on the outside, you're going to find the panthers, the resting and the crouching panthers. Columbia University has the rising cranes, and I got inspiration from them when I was at Brook Green. Now, if you go into St. John the Divine, you're going to find the resting holy family. I didn't do a lot of religious statues. I did a few, and I was so surprised because Bob Hope wanted the resting holy family on his tombstone. That isn't in New York. That's in California. At the Bronx Zoo, you're also going to see my panthers and tigers. Uh, outside of New York City at the Women's Museum, you can see Sybil Ludington. And the very first Hall of Fame for people is at the Bronx Community College, and I did all of the sculptures there. I was so proud of that. So what I'd like to um, talk about now is just the latter part of my life. Um, my husband died in his 80s. He was not well. He was very overweight. He had a heart problem. He had anemia. Well, after my husband passed, he was put in the huge Huntington Mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery. And that's where I was placed as well later on. But after my husband died, I was just so disrupt. I threw myself into my work. I stayed here in Reading, and I also kept Brook Green. And what did I do? I did young Abe Lincoln. I also did a young Andrew Jackson. Um, I also worked on Charles Ives. Charles Ives was the first American composer. He lived in Danbury. There were no tributes to him until um, I did this. And then again, because I was so close to the people in Reading, one of my last statues was General Putnam. I was wanting to do more statues that were local to our area. Well, as I said, I lived until my 90s. I began to have a series of mini strokes. I also lost my eyesight. I always was suffering from elements of TB. But I felt I had a very, very worthwhile life. And as I said, I am now in Woodlawn, and usually Woodlawn, one Sunday a month. You can take a tour because there's so many famous people and families there. And on this tour, they will take you to the huge mausoleum of the Huntington family, of which I was a part. People always say, well, you know, did you win any awards? Oh my God, I won so many awards. And I can't go through all of them, but the biggest awards I won from France, the Legion of Honor, the Purple Rosette, the Chevalier Award of Excellence. In America, the Rodin Gold Medal, the National Academy of Design Medal, 
the Academy of Arts and Science medal. I won a medal for being a woman activist and being part of the suffragette movement. I won the Julia Shaw Award for my fighting bulls, the Widener Peace Award because they felt that so many of my statues embodied elements of peace. And I was most happy with the Syracuse Honorary Degree Award. In Spain, I won the Saltus Medal. I ran the Grand Alfonso 12th Award and the Hispanic Legion Award. I also won several awards in Cuba, Japan, and Holland. But, you know, the awards, that, that was not what was really important to me. What was important to me was that element of only 3% of the statues in the country being of women and less than 2% being made by women. What I wanted to do and hope I've done is show that women are just as important in the field of sculpture as men are. Secondly, I wanted people to realize, try different techniques, try different methods. I used entirely different methods than the men that came before me. Also, I did not do one statue that did not tell a story. And I want you, as you look at sculptures, to see you do that in a painting. When you look at a painting, you say, what is the story allied with that painting? I want you to do the same thing with sculpture. And the last thing, I want any woman artist to be a mentor a role model for other women in the area. I was so proud that in Ridgefield, Meredith Bergman is coming forward for women. 120 years after my Joan of Arc, she put up and had unveiled the suffragette movement. It was Susan B. Anthony, remember, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Sojourner Truth. In Kingston, she also did Sir Sojourner Truth, a slave. She did Pinky the Slave. She has done Marian Anderson in Philadelphia. And in the Boston Gardens, she has other suffragettes. She has Abigail Adams, Lucy Stone, and Phyllis Wheatley, the poet. And this year, I can't believe this is happening. Around the world, in the summer, there is supposed to be a women's walk of fame in major cities. And the cities are supposed to vote on the women, regardless of culture, ethnic group, age, but women of skill. There's going to be a start, 10 or 12 women, immortalized in statues made by women. And in the United States, in New York City, it's supposed to be on the avenue of the Americas. So I hope you will go when it's there and see it. And I hope in conclusion, that you will, as you go by Huntington Park, have a better understanding of the wolf and the bear in that park. And when you go by the schools and you see the animals, there you go, my God, that's Anna Hyatt Huntington. When you come to the library, we need to listen to our elders. That's the torchbearer. And when you go to Bronx Zoo, you go to Columbia, you go to the Metropolitan Museum, you go to the Natural Academy, you go, oh my goodness, Anna Hyatt Huntington. When you travel the world and you see an art museum with the name Huntington, I know the Huntingtons. They were not only artists, they were also humanitarian. Thank you so much for hearing my story.